Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and as always, I'm joined by Jay Gilbert. And I want to remind everybody, we are brought to you by HypeBot.com. Thank you. Go visit HypeBot. Everybody thank over you. at HypeBot, thank you for everything you did to support us last year, and we're looking forward to another another great year of working with you guys. Um, so, Jay, we've got a special guest coming in this week. Um, all I can say is it's very informative. It gives us a little bit of taste of being the artist and the manager. Yeah, it's it's rare when you find someone who's been on both sides, right? Yep. Either you're a musician and you know that world, or you're into management, or you're into labels. This guest crosses through all three of those and understands them. Yep, so just let it roll. Give our special guest Darren a listen, and we'll catch you at the end here. Everybody, so I want to welcome a special guest to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. Today, we are joined by Darren Pfeiffer from the band Goldfinger and from High Four Re Records, High Four Recordings. I don't know how every recordings, recordings yeah. High Four Recordings. Um, Darren's joining us because I feel like he kind of is going to bring an interesting perspective of the musician and the business having been a musician and having now also be a manager, have his own recording company and everything else, I think this is going to give us an interesting perspective versus just talking to a musician or just talking to a manager. So, Darren, welcome to the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. Thanks for having me on, Mike. So um, let's just uh, get the, the, the two-minute spiel of your history here for those who aren't familiar with your background. How did you get into music? I uh, got into music at a really early age. My, my, I came from a large family, so somebody brought a snare drum over to the house, and we all kind of beat on it like kids do. We imagine five kids would, would just attack it. And, but as the interest waned from my brothers and sister, I, I stayed on it, uh, and, and I brought it to my room, and I played it every day, and I learned the nuances of snare drumming. Uh, played along to songs with just a snare, snare drum, and and then uh, my mom realized it wasn't going away, and I fell in love with uh, with the drummers of the time, like uh, Mitch Mitchell and 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 Ringo, and and I loved uh, rock, so I loved Black Sabbath and Van Halen and and Led Zeppelin and the Police, and I, I I got into everything and anything that was drumming. So I got a drum kit, and then just started to play. It got really good, and joined some bands in in the Buffalo, New York area. Um, and uh, then quickly realized that Buffalo and or New York, which I never, ever wanted to live in, was not the place to be. So I moved to Los Angeles in 91, 92, and uh, was in the scene there for a little while. And then I met uh, John Feldman, who uh, me and him started Goldfinger together with another guy named Simon Williams. And that we sold a few million records and off to the races we went for the next 20 some years. And uh, we Goldfinger has slowed significantly down because John Feldman is now a sought after producer and and songwriter for a bunch of people. So, uh, but it was a good ride when it when it would happen, and, and, it, and it taught me a plethora about about the industry on on multiple levels, from management to publishing to licensing and sync to merchandising. I mean, I pretty much learned the ropes on the road, uh, and and from great people that were working. Let, with me. let me ask you a quick question. Typically, when you've got a band there's usually one person in the band who kind of takes on the role of the business right you know, the person who's paying attention to the contracts and the deals and all that stuff was that you uh no we had a manager we had a manager named stephanie brownstein and she was um uh our, you know did all the managing day-to-day -day stuff we had another guy named john reese who did some of the heavy stuff and got us on some of the bigger tours uh but stephanie was our day-to-day -day girl and she took care of the contracts. And she hired the crew and hired the tour manager and to make sure but, that but merch you, was taken. But you out. had, uh, I guess what I'm trying to find out is, did you have a personal interest in learning that side of what was going on? Because there's clearly bands where some band members are just like, listen, I just want to be the lead guitarist. And I want all the adulation on stage. And, you know, give me, give me my per diem, you know, once a week and that's it. And then there's other people in the band who are like, no, I, you know, tell me about this deal. We're, I mean, so were you actively trying to learn what was going on from your manager and stuff like that? Yeah, I was the latter. I was the one uh, very early on when Goldfinger toured you know, before we had management, before we had a, a label. We did some touring and we went up and down the uh, West Coast. 
Yeah, I was the one who got um, early on. I was the one who did the contracts. I was the one who settled. I was the one who did the budgets, paid for the wow. I, had I had a credit card, so I paid for the gas and the van and stuff. And then did the post tour accounting. And then once we got a manager, I was thrilled to just be the drummer, just be the guy that was handling the merch and then and, and playing the shows. But very early on, I, I pulled Stephanie uh, Brownstein aside and said, I want to learn how this works. Show, show me the ropes. And she was always, I have an open book policy, open door policy. You can come in anytime. I'll show you how it works from A to Z. And I took her up on it. I go, what is this? What is this? What is that? How does that work? How, how did I get paid this much money from a tour? Break it down. So she opened her book, showed me Excel, uh, showed me how that works, showed me the, uh, the math, the commissions, the everything. I, I learned it all from her. Did you take a look at your music sales and what kind of royalties? was being deducted and recoupment and all of that stuff too uh yeah a little bit a little bit on the label side we did have a um, monthly or by bi bi-monthly meeting at the label with management to, to see how sales were going how tour support was coming along from universal records uh yeah i was i was involved in, in all that so i, I was privy yeah. to, to to all those numbers and uh it, it was why it was why i loved it and yeah. I, there, there were <laughs> there were things along the way that i didn't like and didn't agree with and and wondered why labels did what they did and took the actions that they took and and i was always puzzled uh on on some of them and i made mental sure. notes like that just doesn't make any sense to me why would you do that it's stupid right so uh, when i uh, moved to canada in 2002 i got married moved to canada i lived in toronto for a long time i took advantage of some of the uh cultural art um funding initiatives they have up there called factor well, Factor is a, a, an acronym for Funding to Assist Canadian Talent on Record. So through Factor, which is funded by the Canadian government, uh, you can get money to record a record. You can get money to promote a record. You wow. get money to, to make multiple videos. And this is free money. Like you, For most of it, there's yeah. one program you have to pay back uh, from record sales. But uh, the rest of it is just grants. Now, there's a lot of bureaucratic hoops to jump through. There's a lot of... Uh, paperwork to fill out and also the music has to be solid it can they're not just going to fun crap so i started high four records at that time around 2006 seven and and signed a couple bands that i really believed in uh, and, and they did well they, they had number one hits the videos were good the tours were sold out one of the bands i had called cauterize was on wind up records i got them off sure. wind up, my label and uh, it, it, that, it really showed me and i was managing these bands too because they didn't have any managers and they were just like free agents and I quickly learned that uh, it, it's 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 sometimes difficult to manage and be the label at the same time because you, you're 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 yeah you have to play a couple different roles. So I don't know if I'll ever manage a band again. Right now, I'm managing Ryan Sims uh, and his endeavor, his EP that just came out a little while ago, uh, which is a lot easier because it's just Ryan Sims. It's not it's not a band of five six guys. Right. That was challenging because they'd call me from the road and say, I'm going to quit. I hate this guy. I want to kill him. I'm like, no, you're not going to quit. You're on tour. <laughs> oh, I want to kill him right now. I'm going to punch him in his face. And no, you're not going to. Some punch things him. never change. So there's this the juggling of of, uh, of, um, of the characters in the band, getting them to like each other, getting them to. And then they would ask me about money and I'd show them how everything worked. And and a lot of guys, well, that makes no sense to me. And, I'm, and I, I, I'd, I'd explain to them again. And they'd, oh, I don't get it. I'm like, why don't you get it? It's math. It's easy. It's just math. Yeah. But I, I vowed to, to always put the artist first and make sure that the artist was taken care of, making sure they knew what was going on, be very transparent, try to try to do everything on a handshake. And uh, it, it really it really showed me showed me the ropes and, and, and gave me a u unique perspective of being an artist and being a drummer in a band and knowing what I liked about management and labels and, and tours. And then when I went, came on this side and I started to work with with artists and like like. Crush Luther and Cauterize, and then now Ryan Sims. Uh, it, it gives me a, a way to, the artists would be like, well, I don't want to ever do that. I'm like, no, we never will do that. And they're like, oh, that was easy. Uh, th you know, things like that that, that give me a, a, a leg up. Yeah, yeah. How, what, what have you, how, how do you see the music industry in 2018 compared to when you were in Goldfinger? I mean, Obviously, you've been through it all. You've seen the completely different industry back then versus now. What's your take on on how things I mean, like, have changed? Like Hangups came out twenty years ago, right? Right, right. It's crazy when you think about it like that. <laughs> yeah, 
uh, back in when we released the self-titled record and then we released Hang Ups, it, it was a much different place than it is today. Um, it was it was it was uh, it, it was easier to get signed back then. Uh, their labels w- weren't really too concerned about illegal downloads or file sharing like they are now. The right. industry was four or five, six times the size that it is now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were A and R teams of people that, that that took care of you in different markets. Every time we went to a city, whether it was Minneapolis or Chicago or New York, Miami, Seattle, anywhere, there was a, a universal rep to meet us and take us to press, and that just doesn't happen anymore. And sales are down. It seems like music has been devalued. Uh, also, you throw into the mix the fact that anybody can buy uh, Pro Tools or anybody can really know how to learn uh, uh, learn GarageBand and get really good at it. I've heard GarageBand records that sound great. Mm-hmm. And not nearly a note was played on an actual instrument. Uh, so uh, the technology out there for people to create music and release it is, is so uh, sharp these days, but that that that's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, that means anybody can pick up a computer and put together some beats and write a song and throw it out into the world on SoundCloud or get distribution through uh, a company and boom, you're quote unquote a record label. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's good. There's a lot of bad stuff. If you if you go to SoundCloud and Bandcamp, there's lots of bad music out there. Yeah. So you have to sift through the, the the bad stuff to get to the good. Whereas back in the day, back in the ninety early nineties or mid nineties. Most of the stuff the labels put out was, was pretty darn good, uh, because the uh, oh my god, my dog. That's all right. Don't worry about That's it. Okay. Damn, we have dogs. Stop. It's okay. Sorry. Don't worry about it. We've had dog interruptions before. Okay. They have uh, one. We assume when the UPS guy gets here. Uh, I just think it's it's a much different culture these days. It's, it is. It's, it's a lot harder for labels to take a band, inter- uh, uh, like a Universal or a Sony. To, to take a band seriously they want to see numbers they want to see tours they want to see uh single success they want to see youtube numbers they want to see social they, they media basically numbers. want you to already be successful before That's they right. get less involved. risk yeah well, and, when they, and then when I they do come the universal involved, back in the day they'll give you a really crappy 360 deal and yeah and most bands don't have lawyers or managers these days because it's really hard to find managers yeah. like myself who are uh development manage- managers yeah. who are I send about 500 emails a day, make about 50 calls a day to people uh, tr- trying to get uh, eyes and ears on my artist, Ryan Sims. I'm trying to get sure. people to listen to him. And I get a lot of people to check him out and, and and they love him and they want to help. And a lot of people don't. And a lot of people don't get back to me at all. So the, the, it, it's uh, it's God's work that, that, that I'm doing. But it's hard to find a guy like me who has the passion for Ryan Sims. Right. Uh, and get out there and, and do the work. And and I listen to music all the time on on, the, on internet and SoundCloud and Bandcamp and other pages, and I find great bands. And, and I look at their socials, and they're killer numbers. And then I reach out to the band. I'm like, hey, what are you guys doing? They're like, nothing at all. Absolutely nothing at all. No tours, no singles, no videos, no radio play. We don't even have a publicist. And I'm like, that's a shame. Like, why don't you just hire a publicist? Well, you kind of hit it on the head a second ago. You're talking about the old music business. I, I worked for Universal for 18 years, and I happened to work these records of yours, and I remember being on those teams, and it was a different time. You had all these different areas, and everybody kind of pitched in together, and we worked it market by market. These days, it's contracted so much that we don't have those teams and they outsource PR or digital or radio or I mean a lot of these things are kind of outsourced based on you know uh, what they have with each one of these artists and I see the same thing that you're talking about where you're looking at some of these artists that maybe have a great social footprint maybe they've got some great streaming numbers but these days depending on where you go it's it's based on a meritocracy. If you've got a great track, there are people that are doing that, as you mentioned, you know, on their computers. It's it's not as big as you might think, you know, because when you record a song these days, you're competing with, you know, Drake and the chain smokers. You know, if you're up and you've got otherwise, it's clearly apparent that you're not at the level, you know, of those artists. But how do you navigate these days when it comes to things like radio airplay or, you know, getting on, you know, playlists at some of these DSPs like Apple and Spotify and Pandora, you know, as a kind of a, as a manager, as a label, all these different hats that you wear, how do you manage that new music business? It's a, it's a challenge every day, to be honest with you. Uh, 
I, I make a list of the people I've called and a list of people who have gotten back to me, people who haven't gotten back to me. And I just follow up. So it's just, it's just following up with people and, and, uh, and then dealing with people like Michael and, and making sure the socials for, for my artists uh, or right now artists are, are tight. Mm -hmm. uh, make sure there is enough content and then we making sure we have uh, we're running contests and we're, we're doing Facebook uh, campaigns and ju just getting just trying to hammer people with marketing impressions to get them to keep coming back to Ryan or get them to take Ryan Sims. Uh, uh, give them a look. Give them yeah. a list. It, it's, it's hard. It, it's, it's a it's a it's a murk, it's murky waters out there right now. It, it's it's hard. But uh, yeah. I have passion for this industry. I have passion for Ryan Sims, and and, and uh, I, I just love the guy. I love the music, and I'm going to keep sledging. And I, I told uh, his investor and his and his team and Ryan that we're one guy away, or one connection away from it going to the next level, or or even to the stratosphere. And I mean, there's talk of getting on commercial radio uh, at uh, iHeartRadio um, through Pittman and, and through his people. Are we just waiting for him to get back to us and seeing what kind of commitment we can make? There's a couple other big irons and some big fires that I'm waiting to to see if they strike. Um, so just I just don't give up. I'm just yeah. relentless. I Look, refuse to, to give up until e either the cycle dies or I'm fired. <laughs> and that's what it takes. Dar Darren, let me ask you. You, you, you. I want to. I want to get your your thoughts on the different types of managers that are out there. You mentioned that you're sort of a manager right now who works on developing the artist. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of manager than a manager who specializes in cutting record deals or specializes in tours or specializes works with established in, artists yeah. works with established artists or the manager who's got all the connections to get you placed in the Toyota commercial. What, what are the different types of managers that you've come across and encountered in your career here? Well, you pretty much nailed it right there. There's the, there's the manager, like I guess below me, that would be the guy or the girl who's best friends with the band. Or, or the mother, or the father, or the mominger, the dadinger, who 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 thinks they know what they're doing, and and sending out calls, and and, and which is fine. You always you, uh, every band everybody every starts guy, that way. Everybody starts you gotta, there. Got to have uh, start somewhere, right? Right. Uh, the development manager is someone like myself who who has to knock on every door, turn over every stone, fish in every river and creek and ocean and lake to to try to find contacts. Uh, and that, that's what I do on a, on a daily basis is make contacts with people and try to find tours for Ryan licensing uh, uh, opportunities, which is something I've been doing over the last couple of days is trying to find him some some placements and some sinks. And then you got the, the manager who, like you said, is really good at, at taking a band and getting them off one label and getting them to, a, to another label. Uh, and those guys have a special set of skills. And then there's the, the manager who has been doing it a long time and will only do a band or an artist if they're signed. And then they got a record deal and they have a touring history. And they'll kind of slide right into that and, and uh, just look at everything and make sure everything's copacetic and then take the 10, 15 percent, whatever it may be. And, you know, manage stuff day to day, book the tours, book the flights, book the hotels, take deal with the accountant, uh, which is uh, which is quite frankly, is really easy. It's just it's just math. It's right. like, OK, we have a tour. Let's book a flight or let's build a tour budget. Uh, the tour is over. Let's break down some numbers. Uh, what's next? Uh, you know, well, everything's easy when you know how it's done. And you were fortunate that you you asked those questions early on. And Michael and I stress this every week is you have to educate yourself. And you did that. You went to your person and said, show me how this works. It's you're right. It's it is math. But people are afraid of things they don't understand. So they need to kind of educate themselves on all those things that you were taught early on. Yeah, and I, I try to teach my artists uh, when I had High Four Records in Canada and now with Ryan Sims. I, I try to show them uh, along the way. And, and Ryan, to his credit, asks a lot of questions about this and about that and about publishing and about who are you talking to and, who, and what did you talk to him about? Hey, can you get me in touch with him? I'm like, sure, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to hoard contacts. or uh, So, yeah, you're right. You have to ask questions if you're a young musician – uh, either either have your manager show you the ropes or help uh, you along the way, or get a book by Donald Passman called Everything You Need to Know About the Music Industry. Now, there's been a number of editions that have come out, and that book is my Bible. I've been reading that book for years. It's I, You guys are familiar with it, right? Yeah, I would only add to that. I just did this thing um, for a writer friend of mine who's doing a piece on the best music books. That's a great book when it comes to contracts and things like that. There's a book out... Uh, by Bobby Owinsky, 
that's really good. Uh, Bobby Borg has a couple of really great books out that cover, you know, do-it-yourself marketing. But your point is well taken. You really just need to, the resources are there. You just need to reach out and educate yourself. It's not that hard. No, it really isn't. Uh, there's like the, that book, your book you mentioned, there's websites, there's conferences. Like if you can go to, if you can get yourself to NAM, if you're anywhere near Southern California coming up later this month. Yeah, uh, next week. Great, great conferences. And I know it's not that hard these days to get a ticket because when you go to NAM, it's literally shoulder to shoulder. I, that's why I hate going. <laughs> it's so go, massive. I go because I have to. I go on yeah. Friday when it's less crowded and i say hi to my endorsers and then i shake some hands and take some pictures and then i I get the hell out of there uh it used to be uh well tell people what nam is those who have never been to nam uh talk a little bit about what it what it is nam stands for national association for musical merchants it happens every year in anaheim california around uh, january late january and basically um every musical merchant whether it's fender or gibson or zildjian or tama or pearl uh, sheet music, violins, uh, audio, uh, pro audio, the, everything you could think of gets together in one convention center and uh, pitches their new wares for 2018. Uh, it's a great place to make contacts if you're Absolutely. a musician looking for a, an endorsement. It's a great way t- for a musician to find musicians. It's a gr- but there's also conferences. There's mu- music industry conferences besides uh, the you know the techie gear stuff, which most musicians love there, there there's conferences there there's also Do you ever go to narm i guess it's now it's called music biz uh conference it used to be known as narm um, that they have in nashville every may uh that's an awesome uh place to go as well to meet like-minded people learn about what's going on in the music business they have all these workshops you know from apple and pandora and spotify and you know so your point's well taken there's a lot of great resources out there yeah, well, and in Canada, if you're Canadian, there's Canadian Music Week. There's North mm-hmm. by Northeast. There's South by Southwest. If you're in the U.S., there's CMJ <laughs> in New York. There's Madame in France. There's there's a million of them that you can go to. And Madame's not that expensive. You think going to Nice would, would be expensive? It's not. Uh, uh, Madame has changed over the years, but it's a great conference. You just you just you just gotta be you gotta be. Per- if you're a manager and you want to get out there and get into the music industry, uh, don't be shy. It's not a business for someone who's shy, who someone who can't walk up to someone cold and say, hi, I'm John Doe. I'm Jane Doe. Nice to meet you. Do you want to get a cup of coffee? If you can't do that, you're going to you're going to you're going to struggle. If you're just going to rely on phone calls and emails, you're going to struggle. There are going to come times when you go to a show or a conference or NAM or whatever, and you're going to you're going to be forced to meet somebody face to face and have an eye to eye conversation with them and, and try to make a contact that way. Well, you know, and and one of the things that I always keep in mind when you're at a conference, you might get your one and only chance to meet that person who is that one opportunity that takes you to the next level. He may be standing at a bar or she may be sitting outside of a conference hall. In line at Starbucks. And and you, you know, you you see their name on their badge and it you recognize who it is and you've got. 30 seconds to decide do i take this chance or do i pass on it and and frankly that you know that's that's what those events are all about is the opportunities that will just Networking. fall in your lap that you don't know where they can lead to but one thing i wanted to mention and you you mentioned it in 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 resources is it's the internet you know you might be a musician right now and your budget could be very very tight that you can't afford to go anywhere for these events. There's no reason you can't be on the internet looking for all sorts of free advice. I mean, this this well, me, this, 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 me, pod, me, this podcast has been running for seven years every week, talking to people like you, Darren, and people from labels and other resources. There's no cost other than your time. Well, you mentioned about uh, having a musician who's tied on funds and, and w- w- but really is driven and wants to go to these North by Northeast, South by Southwest, or these M- M- NAM or CMJs. Or... I always tell people when I go to these things and speak and, and someone says, I don't have a lot of money. I, 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 my mom bought, it, bought me a ticket or I, I, uh, you know, I always tell musicians, whether at the conferences or just out in the streets or at a show, sneak in. It's not that hard. Well, and that's good advice also, and they have special rates. 
you know, all of these things have special rates for indie musicians, indie labels that, that aren't associated, that don't, don't have a lot of employees. When you look at the registration, there's, a, there's always a really cheap entry level, if you don't sneak in, you know, where you can get into those things. Also, the other dirty little secret is that if you volunteer to be a part of it, whether you're on a panel or whether you're helping them, you get free admission. So there are other ways. Yep, there are a lot of ways. And I, I've talked to a lot of people, especially at uh, Canadian Music Week and North by Northeast when I lived in Canada. Uh, I told kids to sneak in, and, and uh, the organizers of, the, of these festivals pulled me aside and said, Darren, you're a panelist. You shouldn't be telling people to sneak in. Well, I'm like, yeah, I, I know. You, you, but, you, uh, you, know, you know what's funny? Related to your sneak in comment, though, but, I mean, we, we, all, we all know this. The majority of business at these events happens in two places. The lobby and the bar yep and Absolutely. you can get into both of those places without yeah. any it's not sneaking in you're just hanging out in the lobby and you're just hanging out in the bar and if you just did that for three days and you don't walk out with some contacts and 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 some new business you're doing it wrong because you don't have to spend a dime to hang out in those two places they may they may go hey you can't open up your laptop and set up an office here on the on, yeah. on the chair so fine then go hang out in the bar for a while then come back to the lobby and then yeah. it's funny you say that about the lobby and like and it's also funny how you said how you when you go to these places and you meet see people at the counter at the coffee line or at the bar you never know who you're going to bump into i was at canadian music week in 2006 and I was in a lobby of the hotel in, in Toronto, and I just applied for Factor, and I was reaching out to some people that I knew there and getting the wheels going as far as getting the funding. So I'm walking through the hallway uh, in the lobby, and I bump into this woman, and we both hit the deck, and her papers fly everywhere. And I and she, she falls to the ground, and I help her. I go, I am so sorry. I feel terrible. I'm so sorry. I help her up. I grab her papers. She's like, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it. I wasn't looking where I was going either. And I said, let me help you. She had a lot of stuff, books and bags. And I said, let me, let me let me carry these to where you're going. She said, like, oh, it's pretty far. And I go, I don't care. I'm a pretty big guy. So so I'm, ca I'm carrying her papers and her bags and, and all of her stuff. And she tells me her name is Heather Ostertag. She was the, the director of Factor. <laughs> so I said, wow. Um, I took her all the way to her, to her place. I put her books down on her, on her, and all her bags on the table. And I, I said, are you sure you're okay? I feel awful. Can I get you a cup of coffee or take you to dinner or buy you a drink? She's like, you're so sweet. I said, well, I'm, she goes, what are you doing here? She looked at my tag and she's like, oh, what's high for records? So I'm like, I'm just trying to get some contacts and meet some people and publishers and blah, blah, blah. And she goes, why don't you, she gives me her card. She goes, why don't you come to Factor and I'll introduce you to some people. So I, there you I go. that's how it works. I went into Factor and then uh, I was fast tracked from that point. That's great. I, I, whatever I applied that's for, a I got a story. Yep. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the old, the old dirty secret is w just go hang out at the circle bar. Every 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 hotel has a circle bar somewhere. Just go hang out there all night, all day, and trust me, people come through there that you would not believe. Yeah. yeah. Also, I, I recommend if you're a manager uh, and you're managing, you want to get into managing a band, find good music. Uh, there, I get a lot of emails from from managers saying, "Check out my band. They're doing this. They're doing that. They're 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 going to tour. They're going to do this." And I and I click on the YouTube link or click on the Bandcamp link, and I'm just like so disappointed. Like they got a great presentation, they got a manager, they got decent social numbers, but damn if the music isn't just awful, just bloody awful. <laughs> I mean, yeah. create get your artists to create good music, and 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 if it's not good enough, then get them in with some songwriters. Find some songwriters that that can bring their music to the next level. Yeah, and because uh, it, it, it's about the product, really. At the end of the day, we can all have contacts. We can all be really nice guys. We can all go to the conferences. But at the end of the day, if if the music isn't good enough, it's it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna it's a tough sell. With Ryan, even there, more so these days because you know with streaming, it's like radio when we were growing up. It's about the song now. They're not even listening to the whole album. They're just it's that song. And if you don't have a great song to kind of intro people to and lead them into more of your songs, you know you're screwed. Yeah, it's got to be about the art. It's got to be about the song. And yeah. luckily with, with Ryan, the guy I'm working on right now, his, his music is incredibly well written. He's a good looking kid and uh, it, it's in, it's infectious stuff. So it's easy for me to sell. I always tell I always joke with Ryan. I said, yeah, I, I would still work with you uh, because it's my job. But uh, thank God I'm, I'm pitching and selling something that's good. Yeah. If it was bad, I'd be I'd wake up every morning bummed out.
Yeah. <laughs> it, it would make your job so much harder if it wasn't good. Yeah, people would be like, Darren, I've known you for 20-some years, 30 years. Why are you getting behind this garbage? But no yeah. one has said that to me yet. Everyone's like, Darren, this kid's good. Let's talk. Let's figure yeah. something out. Let's find an avenue. Let's. What can I do to help you? Um, yeah. so a lot of people have come back to me and said, it's not in my wheelhouse. Tr stylistically, it's not something I, I listen to or like. But, you know, it, but good luck. I can introduce you to some people that do like this. Uh, no one has put, no one has said it's terrible. Not one person has even remotely come close. So if you're going to manage and you want to really get into band management, artist management, find good stuff. <laughs> yeah, management's hard. It's not what people think it is. When you spend time around managers and management, it takes a certain personality. It's a lot of hard work, like you were saying. You know, it's a lot of blocking and tackling. You know, Doc McGee has this great quote. He says, everybody thinks they're a bull rider until they open up the gate. You know, and, and I, I think of that, you know, as management. Everybody thinks, well, I could, you know, I'll just be the manager. I'll just manage. And I've had a couple of my, you know, on the marketing side, a couple of folks who have said, hey, would you consider managing me? And it's like, no, no, I, I wouldn't because you need somebody who has a passion for that, somebody who's good at that. Um, I do what I do. Managers do what they do. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of hard work. It is, especially when you have an easy path. It, right now, it's easy with me because it's just Ryan Sims, and yeah. he's got he's got some some uh, some investors, and and working with them is a dream because they're they're adults, they're down to sure. earth, they got their heads screwed on straight. They, there's no BS. It, whereas a band, it's five or six guys that uh, that are got drug problems or alcohol problems or hate each other and want to quit the band every five seconds. And I'm I'm putting out fires left, right, and center, and and I absolutely hated it. I hated that part of the job. You can't get five guys to agree on where to go to lunch. Well, you know, it, it, you know, it's always the the running joke. If you're going to be a band manager, you're going to be a mother. That's what you, you know. At the yeah. end of the day, you become a babysitter and a mother to that band because not only do you deal with the business, you have to deal with all. You know, hey, I'm going to kill this guy. Why, why are you calling me? I'm trying to land you a freaking record deal, and I don't want to worry about you guys beating the crap out of each other on the on the road. You know. Being a manager is, is is not all glamorous. Uh, being in a band is not all glamorous. I can <laughs> tell you guys yeah. from that point of view, uh, being an artist and being in a successful band like Goldfinger, there were a lot of good times. There was a lot of success, a lot of yeah, you know, platinum records, platinum success, sold out world tours, uh, a, a lot of good things. But there was also 23 other hours in that day, when, when any given day, where you were dealing with drama band drama management drama label drama family drama uh with my wife at times there there was a man there were there was a million fires that could pop up on any given day on any given tour at any given record cycle and they did they popped up all the time and and it was a, it was a challenge uh, to get to this point but i should write a book <laughs> I thought about it. I, 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 I play also in this band for fun called Punk Rock Karaoke. Uh, it's like we're like Weekend Warrior guys. But the band consists of like some pretty heavy hitter punk guys. Like Greg Hudson plays guitar. He was in Bad Religion and Circle mm -hmm. Jerks. Um, Eric Melvin plays guitar. He's in No Effects. Stanley from the Dickies plays guitar. And, and I play drums. And Steven Soto from Do the Do you Apple really City. play instrumental people sing over the top? Yeah, we're alive. Is it really karaoke? Or just... Live karaoke, yeah. So we played That's the Dead Kennedys and Misfits and the Clash and Ramones. And, and we go all over the world. I'm going to Panama. I'm going to Costa Rica. Uh, we go to England. Uh, oh, that we're doing sounds like fun. Vlogging Molly tour. We go to uh, uh, every year we, out of Miami, we do that. Uh, punk rock bowling in Vegas, we do that every year in May. And uh, we got about 80 songs. It's it's out, an absolute blast to, to, to do this um and we don't have a, we don't have a singer and that's the best part of being in this band <laughs> <laughs> because all of us in this band complain that our singers are divas or pain in the asses and no oh, no, no lead singers disease oh my god it's a joy all we do is sit around and hang out we have breakfast together dinner together we like hanging out in the dressing room together it, 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 it's a joy uh it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's it's a release uh whereas with goldfinger uh, not so much. There's there's lots of drama, lots of tension. Yeah, and that's normal. Yeah, Darren, this was an awesome conversation. Um, it it it's always fun to talk to somebody who's been on both sides of the industry, and because I think, like I said, you bring a different perspective to somebody who is just 
the musician who's complaining about everything that isn't getting done or is done wrong or whatever. And, you know, you're also the manager who understands what an artist goes through. And, you know, a lot of times until you've lived it, you will never understand it. Yeah, it does give me a unique perspective. So I'm able to, if I work with another band, uh, which I'm not opposed to, it gives me a perspective to, to teach them the, the ropes, teach them you know, the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. And even with Ryan Sims, like, uh, uh, you know, he's, he's been around a while. He's toured, he's released music. Uh, I'm showing him the ropes. Uh, I'm telling him this is what is good, but what you're doing, and this is bad at what you're doing. And I'll, and I'll get some pushback, sure. Uh, he's he's got an opinion and he's an artist he's creative uh but i I just say hey look um this is what i would do i'm advising what you should do at the end of the day you're your own man i don't own you you can do whatever you want but i strongly suggest this is the right course of action and most of the time if they take my advice it works out for them so a lot of the times when you manage somebody you just got to say hey you can do whatever you want you you're an adult it's america go for it but just keep in mind when something is if something falls apart and something goes south or it doesn't work out, you're going to look at me and go, I should have listened to Darren. I should have <laughs> I, I should have listened to Michael. I should I should have done this. I should have done that. So just keep that in mind before you pull the trigger on something. Right. Right. So uh, website. Do you want to plug anything? Yeah, Ryan Sims. Uh, we've been talking about him at length. Uh, the kid's talented. He's, I mean, you know this. You 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 work with him a lot over the last several months, and he is uh, country Americana with a, a fair dash of rock and pop thrown in there. Country is a, is a word that a, a lot of times scares people that are in the rock or pop or alternative realm. They're like, oh, country. I don't like country. I've always hated country. I, I hear that a lot. Uh, but I'm like, well, give it a listen because. It, 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 a lot of people that that liked rock and roll also liked John Cougar, uh, and he had a lot of he had a fair amount of country in, in his sound, or or Bruce Springsteen, or, or list goes on and on. So give him a listen. There's no slide guitar, there's no violins. It, it's not honky tonk. It's it, you know, I mean, uh, it's it's country with a, with a rock and pop flair to it, and with with a, with a nice dash of Americana. And I just think the kid is really talented and. And I'm not going to stop pitching and calling and looking under rocks and fishing and, and lakes and streams and rivers until I, until he's a household name. So, awesome. uh, so his website is ryansimsmusic.com. Again, www.ryansimsmusic.com. All the socials are there. Um, my radio show, Dangerous Darren Show, uh, it's on Adobe Radio, which goes to iHeartMedia. I have a fair amount of listeners every week, um, and I've had some really great guests. The, the last time I did a show was Kiefer Sutherland, who came on and, and, and talked to me about music and songwriting and country. Wow, that's great. Well, you, ju- you, I, you just had a big guest on this. You, this well, last I just recorded, I just recorded okay. a big guest. He's coming next week. It's uh, Stuart Copeland, a drummer for the police. Wow, that's great. Two, two-parter with him. We had a long talk. About this, about Sting and about the police and songwriting and and what he's doing now with composing music for a million things and that'll be a two parter and uh, I got uh, Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys coming on Cindy Lauper's coming on Gwen Stefani's coming on uh, Daryl uh, 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 John Oates from Daryl Hall and John Oates Hall and Oates mm-hmm. he's got sure. a, he's got a country record he just put out uh, it's and everyone's like how do you get these acts I'm like I just reach out to them you just ask, ask them. you just ask I just ask. It's as simple as going, hey, I got the show. Here's the numbers. Here's here's some of the guests I've had on, which, you know, is pretty impressive. Um, do you want to come on? And t- well, what do you want to talk about? Whatever you want to talk about. If you just want to talk about skateboarding all day long, we'll talk about skateboarding. If you want to talk about your, your music, we'll talk about your music. No pressure. And um, uh, I get a lot of yeses and I get a lot of noes, but I'm pretty lucky to have some of these big guests on. And, th- and that, that website is DangerousDarrenShow.com. Fantastic. Uh, com. It's on every Tuesday on Adobe and iHeartRadio. And uh, I do it just for fun, just just to keep my um, radio chops sharp. Awesome. awesome. Darren, awesome speaking with you. This was great. Great. Absolutely. We've been talking about it for a while. And I'm, glad, I'm glad it finally came to yep. fruition. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Everybody, go, go, everybody go check out Ryan. Go check out Darren's show. And uh, we'll be in touch. And go Vikings, yeah. Go Vikings. Vikings. Go Go Vikings. Vikings. There we go. Take (laughs) care. Cheers. That was a great conversation with Darren. It really was. Um, You know, 
it, it, it was mentioned, full disclosure, I work with Darren and I work with his artist, Ryan Sims, but I just felt like he would make a great guest because of his background as an artist. Yeah. And, and, and not to downplay artists who, who have business knowledge who weren't successful, but he was in a successful band. A, a mega band. Yeah, I mean, I mean as you said, you, 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 we worked, worked you worked them. So, yeah. you know, there's, this is an artist who lived it, saw it, came through all the good and the bad of of the old industry and record labels. Yeah. And, um, you know, now he's wearing the manager hat. Yeah, I hope he writes a book because I would buy it. And check out Goldfinger. I mean, there's some of those tracks have streamed like 30 million times. I mean, this is a band that a lot of people know, got a good following, filled up arenas. They had a really great run. But what I love about Darren is he's done what you and I have talked about for a long time, and that is educate yourself. He asked questions. He didn't know how things worked, so he just asked. And some of that basic advice, like when you go to a conference, Maybe you can't afford the conference. There are ways you can get in for free if you don't want to do that. Be creative. Be creative. Be creative, definitely. Um, you know, I'm not saying Good stuff. I'm not saying screw the conference is over, but no. Listen, you can stand. Nobody's going to kick you out from standing in a lobby, and you never know who's going to walk in to check in to the hotel. Yeah. As you're standing there, so that's right. Look at those name tags. Be creative. You'd be surprised. So, hey, we haven't done a you need help with your online strategy in a while, and I and I've, right. got, I've got a fun one, uh, quick one here that I think uh, everybody should pay attention to. Okay. Um, if you ask your fans to tag themselves in a Facebook post, and you don't have your page settings set to allow fans to tag themselves. You need help with your online strategy. What does that Pretty mean? Pretty easy to do, right? So, you know, <clears throat> you post, and this this is the common way. You post a photo of the crowd at your show. And you say, hey, were you at the show? Tag yourself. Great. It's a great technique. Fans love it. <laughs> there is a setting in your Facebook that will that you can turn on and off that allows people to tag themselves in posts and photos. Make sure that's turned on before you tell fans to tag themselves. Yeah. And I hear people sometimes say, well, I can't find how to cross promote videos or I can't find this setting. It's so easy. If you can't find it, just Google it and they'll show you step by step instructions on everything that you need to know to do these things. It's not hard. Yeah. You know, I would I would just encourage you. Every month or so, just go into the settings on your Facebook page. Even though everything was set up and working a month ago, go in and look at it today. Yeah. Not not because things might break, but because Facebook is adding new things so fast that if yeah. you haven't looked at your settings in a year, I guarantee you're going to go, holy crap, look at all yeah. this great stuff that I didn't know I could do. Because of all these updates, right? Just all of these updates. They never tell you they're updating. They never tell you what was added. You have to go look. So just go take a look at your settings. Um, If you don't have a clue what I'm talking about, get somebody to help you with your online strategy. Yep. All right, guys, that's it. Another episode of the Music Biz Weekly Podcast. We're out of here. We'll see you next week.